Hello everybody, this is Troy and Kelly from Red Tool House. We wanted to take this opportunity and, and dive right into our topic of, of how to find land for your homestead and how to get the best deal on land. So we wanted to talk about that. Land prices obviously are going up, they're really expensive, the per acre price just seems to keep climbing and climbing no matter where you are in the country. And uh, of course you know, they don't make any more land, so it's not like there's new land coming available. So we wanted to talk about uh, and we want to speak from experience. What we did, there were three key steps that we implemented in finding our land. And we were able to get this 100 acres for a net out-of-pocket expense of $20,000. So that's $200 an acre that we were able to, uh, to get this land for. So how did we do that? We did, well, we did that in three key elements. Element number one was how we looked for the land. We didn't have... Um, we, we wanted to be as broad as possible with how we look for land and, and, and be as creative as possible and not just using realtors. In fact, we, we took realtors and, and got them completely out of the scenario there. Step number two, we, we, we had a vision. We wanted to look at land, maybe land that wasn't very, uh, um, was, was raw or what would be the proper term, was maybe a diamond in the rough, <laughs> needed some work. We were going to trade sweat equity for money savings when it came to per, per acre price. So we were looking for things that were maybe run down or, or uh, in, in bad shape, had some issues there. And step number three, we wanted to utilize any natural resources that the property had in a, in a uh, re responsible manner, of course, but, it, but look at that as an opportunity to help us with our goals of, of, of financial, uh, getting fun, something that we could financially afford. Okay, so step number one, how we went about looking for land. So back in 2000, we moved up here from Florida and we decided we wanted to find land rural, but still had to be a commutable distance from the town that we worked in. Kelly and I both were working. We didn't have kids at the time. So we wanted to be able to commute uh, a logical distance. And I think we set that to what? What was our time that we set? 45 minutes, no more than an hour. Yeah. So we said, I mean, yeah, we could, we could probably tolerate driving 45 minute drive to work. Um, so, so we had these certain parameters, and it took us how it took us how long to find? We were looking for about a year. Was it? Yeah. So yeah, I guess it was. So, so yeah, we looked we looked for about a year driving around, and we we kind of took the map, and and uh, we worked in Charleston, West Virginia, which is the capital of our state. So we kind of drew this circle around the the map and said, okay, we're going to look in these counties surrounding the the capital, but we're not going to go beyond this point. So, um, so what did we do? You know, obviously the logical thing you'd want to do is obviously just, just call a realtor or, or look in the newspaper to see land for sale. Well, we knew that wasn't going to work. Um, a, the reason why we suggest maybe avoiding a realtor is when a realtor lists a piece of property, especially raw land, realtors really don't like to mess with raw land. But even once a piece of property was listed, it was already listed at a, a maximum price. There, there was no deals to be had because uh, a realtor had gotten in there and said, okay, if I'm going to make this worth my, my while, I want to make sure this property is listed at the maximum per acre that we can find around here. So uh, we wanted to avoid that. And, of course, we were taking our time. I wasn't going to tie up a realtor's time for, for a year as we were trying to find the perfect piece of property for us. So what is that step of just looking around? Well, in our situation, we literally just drove around. So uh, driving around the, uh, the countryside, looking at different places, and, and our, our plan was, okay, if we see what looks like to be a large tract of land, something that's maybe abandoned, has an old abandoned farmhouse on it, it's overgrown, all those type of things, then, then we'd make a little note. Okay, look at that. Where, how does it lay? Where's, you know, what's flood issues? All those type of things that we're kind of making these criteria. And uh, so we found this piece of land. And how would, how would you describe this piece of land that we found when we found it, Kelly? Scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scary was definitely a good, a good word, yeah. Um, it was not something that you would have gone searching for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I found it first and then brought you down to look at it. And, and what was your initial reaction when you, uh, when I drove you through the creek to access the property? We I thought it was street. a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, I guess it would seem kind of like that. Um, so the, uh, the original property, uh, when, when we found it in 2000, had an old farmhouse on it that probably was the neighborhood party hangout. Uh, it was the house was completely gutted. It was no way in the world you could restore it. Uh, garbage everywhere. And what we discovered that this land had been abandoned, had literally been uh, forsaken for 20 some years. So not only had things just fallen to ruin, 
but um, some of the, the local neighbors realize that, hey, there's a whole bunch of land here that nobody's using. We can party on it. We can dump our garbage on it. We can take our tires and dump it on it, all that type of stuff. So, yeah, to say, um, to say this property needed some work was, is a bit of an understatement. Definitely. Yeah. But, uh, but that's kind of the key to this. So we found this piece of property, and, and believe it or not, this was the one that, uh, that rose to the top out of all the, all the ones we looked at. And we knew this was going to be a balance of, okay, this place is trashed. So we're going to have to spend a lot of time and money getting this place fixed or getting it cleaned up. But what can we get a price for? So, so that becomes my, my you know, kind of next step is, okay, you find a piece of property you like that's not listed. How in the world do you find out who owns it? So what we did is, is in our scenario, we just started knocking on doors around the area. Hey, do you know who owns this big piece of land up here that's got all the trash on it? And after three or four door knock, uh, knocks, we, we found, actually found the sister of uh, the lady that was, that was taking care of her dad that, that owned it. So it was a long convoluted story, but we were able to get the contact information, started talking to them made an offer on the property of 55000 and they jumped all over it. And it's one of those things I could have probably have gotten for cheaper had I negotiated a little bit more. But we knew it had garbage, we knew it had all those issues, but also I knew it had, from walking the property, I knew it had a lot of timber on it. And where we are in the Appalachian Mountains, timber, you know, hardwood timber is, is obviously very, it's, it's everywhere, but it's uh, you know, a very good resource and it's obviously a very good source of income. So that was something I really wanted to check out. That was why we we, we like this piece of property. So uh, so that's what we recommend. Obviously, if you can't knock on doors, uh, you know, back in 2000, we didn't have the benefit of Google Earth. We didn't have the benefit of being able to uh, go to the county uh, uh, county website and be able to bring up the tax map and see who owned that. But that's another good tip I'd like to give you. If you're looking for a piece of property, especially if it's something that you can't just drive around, say if you're going to try to homestead out of state where you live now, is look at use google maps and and just look and say okay i want to try to homestead around this small town in washington state or idaho or whatever wherever you're going and you you find you look at the the satellite view of that and you just start to look around those areas and see what's developed what's undeveloped what looks like farmland or homestead or whatever you're looking for wooded mountainous flat whatever criteria fits your uh, homesteading needs and then you can obviously find out what county that's in and start looking at county maps and all that stuff is now public record it's always been public record at the courthouse but now it's online in public record so you can see the tax layout you can see what people are paying in taxes on that property and you can see who owns it so if you see it you know it's owned by so and so and has been for so many years and there's a house on it then chances are they're probably not going to sell but if you find hey there's 30 acres that have nothing on it the guy that owns its address isn't in the state that the property's in it's somewhere else and you know, are the taxes in, are they delinquent? Are they in arrears? Is there an issue there? So you may be able to find an opportunity where somebody's got a piece of land that I don't want anything to do with. So that would be my recommendation. And you can reach out to them specifically and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about your property. So that's what we recommend with step one is avoid the realtor, uh, do your homework, drive around, utilize technology, look at the county tax maps, those type of things, and find land that looks like it's, it's been abandoned or not used and uh, then again reach out to the property owner there. Well as we've already mentioned our next step was of course was uh, realizing that this property had some potential to it but also needed work. So uh, how would you describe the the condition of the property when we when we got back here past where the barn is now Kelly where, where that uh, looked like somebody had tried to have a mechanic shop or a, a towing facility what what do you remember from all that? Well once we really started to dig into the property we saw there were a pile of tires um, where we discovered we think they must have had a mechanics shop here. Um, they obviously never used trash service here and um, just took all of their trash and threw it outside and um, appliances back in the valley. There's appliances that still get unearthed as storms move through. Um, so yeah, it was it, Brains appliances, yeah. quite a challenge. Yeah, I, I believe um, at that time we took 220 tires off the property. So, um, so we realized, okay, you know, the, the trade-off was to get this property for $55,000, so that's $550 an acre, that the trade-off was to get it for that low price, we had to do some work when we first bought it. We couldn't come in and start building our house. We couldn't come in and start homesteading or doing whatever we wanted to do at that time. We were going to have to spend a lot of time cleaning it up. 
As we were doing this cleanup, one other good tip to give you, if you find that you have a piece of property that, you, that you've purchased and it has a lot of trash on it, what we did is, is we kind of reached out to, to people to find out if, were there any, any scrap metal haulers, any junk haulers. And we found a couple guys that you know, that, was their, that was their livelihood, was to haul uh, recyclable material. So we had all these appliances, we had old cars, we had uh, car parts. I think I found a 65 Chevy pickup cab inside a big multi-floor rose bush. I mean, just <laughs> stuff that we unearthed. And um, so fortunately, we found these guys that would haul. As long as I would bring it down close to the road, then they would come and, and haul it off. Well, what about natural resources? Well, again, depending on where you are homesteading, obviously if you're out in, out in the desert, you're, you're not going to have timber options. Um, and I can only speak from the experience that I have, but being in Appalachia, being in the Appalachia Mountains, there's tons of hardwood. You can see in the camera behind you, there's a whole hillside of, of hardwood. So uh, I'm no timber expert. I'm not a, I'm, I'm not trained forester or anything, but you, know, you can walk around a piece of property and see, are the trees straight and are they big? You know, that's, that's, way oversimplifying it but that's kind of what we looked at okay it looks like um, there's a lot of timber here and we even asked the property owner when's the last time you had it timbered and they said well it's you know we had one small portion of it timbered and it was 20 30 years ago the the thing i can't stress enough is you gotta hire a timber broker you gotta hire a forester who knows what he's doing because there's all kinds of horror stories that you hear of people getting messed over not only do they get um, taken for their money but their land was left in bad shape. They didn't. Yeah, they took more than they were supposed to. They even went over on the neighbor's property and took some. So now you're liable for that situation. So, timber broker is going to be your advocate to keep that from happening and, and to make sure your property's put back the proper way. So, uh, so what we did with our timbering process is we hired a broker, and that broker comes through and he actually walks the property and he inventories everything on here. And literally makes a, a, a head of spreadsheet that he gave me of all the wood that he marked that would be marketable. And we gave parameters. We said, we don't want anything less than 16 inches in diameter cut. That's what's called selective cutting. And, you know, specific hardwoods, nothing smaller than 16 uh, inches in diameter. And that's what's available. So he calculated 147,000 board feet of timber. He managed all that to put it out to bid. Uh, the, the loggers had specific uh, details they had to follow. They had to put it back a certain way. Long story short, we sold 147,000 board feet of timber for $35,000. So you look at the cost of the property, $55,000. We sold $35,000 worth of resources off of it immediately. And so we were only out $20,000 at that point. So that was a really good way for us to offset the cost of the property. And not to mention that we still have quite a bit of timber left. Yeah, yeah, and that was the whole point of selective cutting. Again, what we had, each, each piece of property is going to be unique as far as timber available, but what we had allowed us to be that selective and still sell 147,000 board feet. But now, fast forward to today, 17 years later, and I've got marketable timber standing here again. So they could go back and cut the exact same spots that they cut and still put that same parameter in place. And I could make, maybe I wouldn't do 35, but I could easily make tens of thousands of dollars timbering again if I wanted to. One thing to consider as well, there's selective cutting and there's also clear cutting or pulp wood cutting where they come in, they cut everything. Um, now again, that's a slash and burn type of thing that people freak out about, but you can do that, you can manage that in a way, again, utilizing a broker. Imagine if you bought a large tract of, of land that's wooded and it has some flat areas, but it's all under, under timber. You say, well, no, I want, this to be, I want this to be pasture. I need this cleared because I want to have uh, animals on my homestead. I want to have cattle, goats, pigs, whatever. Well, then you come in and say, okay, broker, I want you to make manage the sell of this timber, and we're going to clear cut every bit of this. And they're going to come in and obviously cut it, take it all out, and it's going to look a little rough initially, but you'd be amazed how fast, with the, with the consultation of a good timber broker, how fast that can be put under pasture. You know, within a year, you could have really good pasture land very quickly. Those are the steps we want to recommend. And granted, everyone's situation is going to be unique. This isn't a, a, a one-stop shop to fix everything, but... Um, I think you can learn from what we experienced and, and what we were able to do uh, to really help maybe broaden your search. If you're just going to real estate pages or, or land broker pages on, on the internet and looking for land that way, you're, you're just not allowing yourself to, to get access to as much property out there as there is. There's just so many pieces of abandoned land that nobody wants to mess with. 
And that was a situation with the lady that we bought this off of. She said, we talked about selling it years ago. We knew there's no way in the world it's in bad shape it is. Nobody would ever want it. So when we came to offer her money, they were super excited and, and jumped all over it. So ours is not a unique story. There's There's got to be hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of property out there that are the exact same situation. If you don't mind rolling up your sleeves, you don't mind getting a little dirty, you don't mind moving a bunch of junk, you don't mind wading through other people's trash or, or having to look through trash to see the vision of what the property could be, then you can really get that land for a good price and really allow you to, uh, to reach your homesteading dreams way sooner than you think. Okay, one more point I'd like to make about timber. You can see this is our property. This was timbered 17 years ago. It is a very thriving, very healthy forest right now. Because of our selective cutting, we were able to take out, thin it out, but not, not totally destroy it. And of course, I have these, these awesome roadways through the, uh, through the woods, and that gives me an opportunity for food plots and obviously access to the property where I normally wouldn't have had it. I'm really a big fan of timbering, if it's done responsibly. This is a renewable resource. It does grow back, but we obviously have to be good stewards of what we're given and not trash the land. But a, a, a timbered forest can be a healthy forest, can be a vibrant forest, really get a lot of wildlife in, really give you an opportunity to, uh, to build that type of habitat. So I encourage you, if you've got the opportunity to look at that, um, use that as a resource, use that as a revenue for your property. Another thing as well is there's specialty markets. Look at specialty markets. When you get into White Oak, per se, right now, a barrel stave market is really high because of all the craft beer industry. So there's a lot of demand for barrel stave wood, and that's primarily White Oak, a certain diameter with um, a, um, not a limb up to a certain point, so a nice straight tree, no limbs, certain diameter. Uh, consistent looking trunk and that's really bringing in a premium so again that's why I always encourage hire a broker a broker is going to be able to give you that insight obviously since he gets a commission he's got some skin in the game as well so he wants to see you get the maximum dollar for your timber so check that out I think that's a great opportunity also don't forget to sign up for our e-newsletter if you go to redtoolhouse.com there's just a link down at the bottom big red box that uh, encourage you to sign up each month, again, we're giving stuff away. We have a little little gift uh, we draw from our uh, from our email list randomly. This month, for the month of April, it is a StormTech multi-tool. Really nice multi-tool. I like it. Very sturdy. It doesn't. It's it's not cheap. It's uh, it's not flimsy. It's it's a very sturdy tool. I, I like it just as much, if not more, than a Leatherman. So uh, we're giving that away. And obviously, be sure to check us out on Facebook. Go to facebook.com forward slash Red Tool House Farm. And give us a thumbs up uh, to get, support us on this video and, and subscribe if you haven't. Again, we're trying to release a video every Friday uh, dealing with topics of homesteading. And we appreciate everyone watching. Take care. <laughs> I'm free. I'm free to jump through the woods. Right.